I've been loving being around this church and this group of people. I've been, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Aline, and um, I have been around the church really for the last year or so, and, and just getting to know this family and watching what people do. But one of the themes that I've picked up that this church has become increasingly passionate about, passionate about is that they have a hunger to see God healing people and touching people's lives. And so when Andy asked me if I could speak this Sunday, um, and I was just praying and asking God, what is that you have on your heart? I was kind of surprised because I thought healing something we talk about a lot, but I felt like God wanted me to add some more momentum to what he's doing. And so when Andy spoke last week, he spoke about us having momentum and adding to our journey. And one of the things that he was sharing with us was the importance of sharing testimonies and stories so that we would add momentum to one another's faith and courage. Um, And in our small group, we've been on a journey. Um, Put your hands up if you're in kind of Matthew's small group with Matthew and Cassie. Okay, I'm really proud of these people because one, they took the risk to invite me to do some creative stuff with them. Um, And for some of them, that meant picking up a paintbrush and some paint that they'd not done for maybe 15, 20 years longer, maybe, for some of us, but, um, and having a go at things. But one of the things that I shared with them was this isn't about learning how to do art or music or poetry. This is about learning to trust the Holy Spirit and partner with him. And the creativity is just a tool to help you build that relationship. And so this morning, I felt like I I would share a little bit of my story and journey in terms of how God's been teaching me about how he heals people and especially through creativity. Okay, are we up for that? Good, okay. And um, I I love illustrations. Who likes illustrations? Okay, who's wearing any of these at the moment? Did anyone bring one to church? Okay, if you have a glove, get it out. You will not forget this, I promise, because I'm showing you something. Okay, if you have a glove, I just want you to hold it in front of you. Okay, can that glove do anything? Can it touch anyone? Can it pick anything up? Can it do anything at all? Okay, if I put my hand inside that glove, can that glove do things? Okay, it can touch people. It can tell stories. Um, it can keep my hand warm, but it can do things. And um, what we've been learning as a small group, and one of the things I'm kind of on a life's journey to discover, is what does it look like if I say yes to the Holy Spirit putting me on like a glove? Okay? And that's what I want us to think about this morning. What would it look like if I said yes to the Holy Spirit putting me on like a glove? And that's really all it's about. Andy said last week, you know, he is the healer and we're healers because he is the healer and we have him inside us. The glove is not the healer, the toucher, the picker-upper, but when it's filled with my hand, it can do things. And when we're filled with the presence of God and we say yes, we're available and ready to be all kinds of things, okay? So saying yes to God and learning to partner with the Holy Spirit is a lifelong journey that we're on. But when we say yes, incredible things begin to happen. So we've been saying again and again and again, he heals, God heals, and he wants to see everyone healed. And this um, collage of handprints up here is a collage of people who've discovered that that's true. And each of them has put their handprint on there, and beside it, they've written down what's happened when they've said yes to the Holy Spirit, putting them on like a glove, and then reaching out and touching people and asking him to heal people. So this week, my wonderful little small group were brave enough to meet me in the Eye Cafe on Sucky Hall Street and say yes to coming out on the streets and seeing what would happen if we created things and we just loved people. And I was incredibly proud to watch as they took these little cards that we'd made and gave them to people on the streets and blessed them. So before they came, we said, okay, God, what do you want us to bring? What do you want us to take? And Matthew brought a jumper with him. And so the first woman my little group met on the street was a woman who was homeless and cold. And so he was able 
to give her his jumper and to bless her and to pray with her. Very, very simple. But if you were there, you would have watched her whole face change as she discovered there was someone there who loved her. Are we okay or is that too squeaky? Stay in the middle. Okay, don't move about. I'll stay on my spot. I'm not good at that. I like moving. Um, But that was incredible. And then Grace. Is Grace still in here? Grace is there. Grace drew, I love the card. Was yours the diamond, Grace? Is it a diamond you draw? What did you draw? Was it Naomi? Uh-huh. Okay, I had a little, it was Naomi who was with me. Grace was with the other team. And um, Naomi had drawn a little card, and we met two girls who were listening to a bus girl on the street. And um, she was there, and we began to talk, and she had the courage to walk up and start the conversation, because that's the hardest part sometimes, and to give her her card. And the girl's reaction was, can you remember, Grace? Yeah, it was like, this is the best day of my life, you know? And it was just this, someone came and found me. Um, So we did pray for healing. The people we prayed for, none of them were able to test out the things we prayed for. But I was just incredibly encouraged that people said yes to going with God and having a go at something. And we're beginning to do it. And I know all of you are beginning to do it. And um, the other fun part was discovering that what we did in small group spilled over into the next day. So at the end of the night, we had walked to Andrew to the train station and we had Mars bars that he brought. And um, we gave them to the people who were working there and we just said, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for being on duty and serving us. And you can see the look of confusion on their faces. (laughs) Um, And then there was one woman who kind of then came to join us and I gave her one and then a door opened and I could tell that we had favor just to talk a bit more with her. And she was practically in tears as she hugged us just because we'd said thank you. So the next morning, Matthew still had a Mars bar in his pocket, and he was telling me this morning that he walks past the lollipop man every day, and he was able to thank the lollipop man with the Mars bar. And so what we're learning when we intentionally go out to practice something is really just building experience so that our minds shift and it becomes normal for us to do this in our everyday life. How many of you meet somebody who works in the public service sector every day of your life? You go through a train station or you walk past the lollipop lady or the lollipop man. That person is someone in your life every day that you can say thank you to. And we can start there. And imagine what would happen if you then had favor to offer to pray for them and you saw them healed. That's kind of the start of what becomes a bigger story. Okay, we're going to flip to the next slide. Okay, I was always someone who loved images, pictures, creativity. When I trained as a teacher, I did a, quite a long dissertation and study, actually, on how g- communication and learning needs to be more than just words and sound. So why did I bring a glove in with me at the start of church? Because some of you need to see something to remember it and learn it. Some of you are great at hearing stuff, but some of you need to see it. But most of us, to be honest, actually have to experience it. And I did a whole study on that as I was learning. So for me, it was always part of what I did. But I didn't have the other side of understanding that God wants to move supernaturally through everything that we do and create. And so there was a point in my life where I began to hear stories that got me interested. And so some of you will have heard me share this story before, but this, I would say, is one of the first testimonies that I heard that got my attention, and it was the story of a woman who'd been in the healing rooms at Bethel as a painter, and she'd been painting pictures to release healing, and she painted this one morning um, when a woman had come to the healing rooms. It was about this time of year. It was leading up to Christmas, and she'd been told, you need to celebrate Christmas early because you're not going to see Christmas. And so you can imagine how much hopelessness there was inside of her. She had a, a brain tumor. The diagnosis was not good, and she'd come to Bethel with very little hope, but kind of as a last choice. And my friend Kate, who's a pastor at Bethel, she got hold of this woman and she asked the Holy Spirit, how, how are we going to shift the way this woman's thinking? And how are we going to release healing into her life? And she saw this painting. 
And so she walked the woman over and she just said to the woman, look at this painting. She didn't pray for her. She didn't do anything else. She just said, look at the painting. And as she's looking at this painting, she begins to feel something dribbling out of her ear. And um, later on, what they realize is what dribbled out of her ear was effectively the brain tumor. Because when she went back, they did all the studies, all the analysis, and there was no brain tumor there. It could not be found. It's incredible. Nick wants one of them in his surgery. People come in the door, they look at the painting, they're well, they go home and they don't even get to make an appointment. That would be a good painting, wouldn't it? Um, So I heard this testimony along with lots and lots of other testimonies and I began to say, okay, God, there is something that you can do beyond speaking encouragement through a picture or a piece of art, beyond communicating who you are and a great idea about who you are, but there's actually a presence inside of what's being created that is making a difference. And so I'm going to take you to the end of the story, and then I'm going to come back. So kind of Quite a long time later, after I'd been exploring creativity and art a lot, I was painting in worship, and I had my friend Drew beside me, and I didn't know what I was going to paint, but I suddenly saw his shadow on the canvas, and um, I felt like I was meant to release Drew's testimony, and Drew came to an art class, I got to know him, I talked to him, and I discovered that he'd come to Bethel not long after this woman had been healed and her her brain tumor had kind of drained out her ear. And they brought the painting into a Sunday morning service and they shared the the story. And they'd invited people to come and look at the same painting after the service and to get healed. So Drew was in the room. He, He turned up in Reading because he ran out of petrol. You can read his story kind of online. It's incredible. But he was there because he ran out of petrol. And he'd come to the service, and he'd been bipolar for his entire life. Um, and he was at a point where he was saying, I am desperate, God. He was just desperate. And he didn't actually come to look at the painting to be healed of bipolar. He had something else wrong at that point. Can't remember precisely what. But as he looked at this painting, he started to laugh. And so what I was capturing on this painting was just the sense of joy in, in, in Drew that was given to him in that painting. And he now said, shares that he never, ever stopped laughing. And I really do know the end of that story because he came through two years of school of ministry. He got involved in an arts apprenticeship group I was in. And he's now left Bethel and is part of a team planting a creative arts school. And he is healthy and well. He's an interior designer. It helped him paint one of the cafes in in Reading that he was kind of employed to work on. And so his life was completely shifted by the testimony and by that painting. Um, So we have one more. Um, So a a little bit later on in the story, I'm then doing what I'm doing this morning. I'm leading a workshop on healing and creativity and I get one of my students to draw a picture and it's this picture here before we start and I just say draw something that you believe God wants to heal to release healing so she drew this picture and she didn't show me it and she said I think this is later on she said I thought it was about hearing so I share the testimony I've just told you and I continue on I don't stop and eventually I pause and just say to everyone, has anyone got any questions, anything you'd like to share? And this woman is like waving her arm around. So I'm like, okay, something's going on. And I said, well, what happens? What's going on? She said, well, when you were sharing that testimony, I felt moisture in my ear and I took my hearing aid out and liquid began to drain out of my ear. And I was a bit embarrassed, but I realized I could hear perfectly in that ear. Um, So she shares that story, which of course creates a lot of excitement in the room. And this girl who's never seen God heal anyone through any of her pieces of art ever before suddenly says to me, I've got a picture. And so I asked this lady how her other ear is, because she has a hearing aid too. She says, oh, it's not any better. So the intern puts the picture on that ear and we pray for her. And then we get her to go to the other end of the room, which is a bit smaller than this. And we start talking to her and the hearing comes back 80% in her other ear as well. It was incredible. So, 
But it's a journey, it's a process. But all these stories and testimonies took me from hearing and being curious to practicing and having a go to seeing that happen in the room while I'm speaking about it. Yeah. And it, to me, it's just this fascinating, wonderful journey of seeing what God loves to do. So how did I get from hearing that testimony to standing in a room, teaching and talking about it and see it happen in front of my eyes? Well, for me, I was brought up in Scotland, which we know and like to call the land of the book, the Bible. And so I wanted to know, well, where is this in the Bible? You know, it was important to me to think, well, I can see it happening, but I want to understand it theologically. I want to know where this comes from. So I'm going to take you on the journey I took myself on to understand a little bit about this. So if we go into the Old Testament, um, we discover that this is God's idea, that when Moses is looking for a solution for the Israelites who are sick, and you can go and read the story in Numbers 21 and verse 9. It's in that section of Scripture. Um, But Moses didn't know what to do, but he chose to ask God for an answer. And God gave him a creative idea. He said, I want you to make a bronze snake and put it on a pole so that when anyone gets bitten by these snakes that are poisoning people and annoying people, that they're going to live and not die. Now, how many of you, if God said to you, if you make a sculpture and set it in the middle of your living room and when you look at it, you'll never get a cold again, would actually do it? Because that is the challenge that we're facing because we have this hunger to see healing, but we've got to learn how to partner with the Holy Spirit and let him wear us like a glove. And so for me, I've discovered that God moves through creativity, and I think part of why he does is because it requires us to do something, to put into action the faith that we have that he's going to come and heal. So when he says to Moses, make a snake, Moses had to be obedient. He had to trust, and he had to have faith to make the snake, to tell the entire Israelite nation who he wasn't always that popular with that this was going to work, and then to actually see it happen. So... The snake that was trying to destroy him them was put into a model, a little sculpture. They look at it and they're healed. Okay, let's jump on to the next slide. I love this one actually because I think there's keys in here for us as a church at Hope. So whenever the spirit from God came upon Saul, David would take his harp and play. The relief would come to Saul. He would feel better and the evil spirit would leave him. How many of you have read that story before? Okay, so we're familiar with the fact that God did that with David. But when we unpick that story, what was happening? David was taking his musical instrument, he was playing music, and the Spirit of God is coming and creating an amazing impact on King Saul, who is being plagued by spirits that are tormenting him, and the spirits leave. So the presence of the music coming into room makes a difference. How did David know that? David knew how to worship and he knew how to play. That's why he was there. But I think he learned something in that experience about what God would do when he played music. Because later on, when we go and read in his first Chronicles, if you want to write it down, it's 29 and 20. This is what it says. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed low and fell prostrate before the Lord and the king. I think David had discovered in that moment with King Saul that something happened when we worshipped. And I don't think that he stopped there. So by the time he became king, he changed the way that people worshipped in the nation of Israel. And he taught people how to understand that when they came together in corporate worship, that they would release the presence of God. And that David was faithful so that God kept on giving him more. And I think David had keys in his hand that meant that when people worshipped, things changed in the nation of Israel and brought about a shift. So I think God is calling us to be innovative with the way that we worship. Because we know how to worship when we come together on a Sunday morning. And we know how to take our music onto the streets, a lot of us, and play incredible music. But um, Tim shared a dream with me. Can I share your dream with church? Okay. I'm about to. Um, 
But Tim said, you know, I'd love it if while I'm playing music, the people that are hearing it are impacted and changed by my music. I'd love it if people started getting healed in the street because of how I'm playing music and how I'm worshipping. And I think that's a God dream. You know, I think that starts just like King David in Saul's courts, playing his harp and seeing King Saul get healed. I think that idea is God, that when you go out onto the streets and you play your music, it's no different from what you do in here. This morning, Matthew sang prophetically over you, and how many of you felt your heart being healed because of how Father God was talking to you about how much he loved you? How would that be if we were on the streets and we were hearing the Father's love song being sung over the people walking through the streets? It impacts us. It's going to impact them. Some of them, their hearts aren't yet ready to receive all of it, but some of them are. And, you know, the guys that play out in the streets will tell you there's always a few that will stand for a while. You know, they'll stop their pause, and they're the people that God's touching. Imagine what would happen if some of us partnered with those musicians and said, I'd like to be out on the street with you next time you're busking so that when that happens, I can start a conversation with that person. And I can chat to them, and I can go and get them coffee, or I can go and pray for them. Just being there and building a relationship with these people who are hungry but have no idea what they're hungry for. But when they hear this music, they just like, they're like, because the presence of God is there. So I think God wants to start healing people through the music in this church and not just on a Sunday morning. So you're going to need to get creative and learn how to do that. Okay, we'd say a lot only to do what we see Jesus doing, like Jesus is our example. So it's fascinating to read your way through the Gospels with the mindset that says, how did Jesus heal people and what role did creativity play in that? And so I went through the Gospels and just read and looked at what Jesus was doing. And um, I was really struck by the fact that Jesus constantly says, I only do what I see my father doing. And I almost feel like there's a step when we release healing that sometimes we miss out, which is to say, Father, what are you doing? Because sometimes someone will come to us asking for healing for something, but actually God has in mind something else that he wants to touch them with or something more that he wants to touch them with. But we don't know what that is unless we ask him. And the thing that absolutely fascinates me is that the Holy Spirit has chosen to need one of these. You know, I I was thinking about it as I was preparing. I was like, but Holy Spirit, you're powerful enough to appear all on your own and do things. And then I thought, well, is he? And he is, but he's chosen not to. He's made it his choice that he actually wants to be hosted by somebody. He wants somebody to wear him like a glove. And he wants to move through you. So if we don't ask that question, he doesn't have an opportunity to do what he wants to do. So, then Jesus said to the man, stretch out your hands. So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. Jesus had a creative strategy. It was called doing a prophetic act, you know? If you stretch out your hand, you'll be healed. I was um, in a church in Oregon, and we were um, teaching about this and exploring it. And um, one of the students who was with us, you know, we said, we want you to ask God what he wants to heal and have a prophetic act. So she said, well, I feel like there's someone with a shoulder injury, and you can't kind of, like, move your arm around properly. And sure enough, there was a guy in the audience who'd, who'd hurt his arm, and he couldn't move it more than this. And she said to him, well... She didn't pray for him or anything. She said, God's going to heal you if you lift your arm up and pretend you're going to strike one of those fairground things that, you know, the strong man things where the thing goes up to the top and it says it's strong. And so he he kind of cautiously and tentatively does it once and then the second time goes for it and all of a sudden his arm comes the whole way up, no pain, completely restored and completely healed. It was a creative strategy and it looks like just what Jesus did here. It was kind of like, partnering her courage and her faith to say, if you do this, and him being willing to step into that and say, yes, I'll have a go and trust that God's going to come and touch and heal me. It's kind of fun. 
you know? I think this is so much fun because I think for some of us, we've been going after this and we've, been, we, we've moved from feeling like we have to fast and pray for 20 years before we can release healing over someone. But now we're slightly stuck because we're, we're praying and we're speaking the words, but we're not necessarily seeing the breakthrough that we're looking for. Um, and I think if you just pause and say, okay, Holy Spirit, what is it you have in mind? What do you want to do? And you imagine what you're about to do. You watch what God might do. And then you actually have the courage to speak it out. I think you're going to see God doing things that you've not seen him do before. Does that sound good? Okay. So let's look at another one of Jesus' stories. Did I go to half past or to quarter two? When did I go to? Somewhere between the two. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. Then he had spit on the man's eye and put his hands on him. And Jesus asked, do you see me anything? He looked up and he said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened and his sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. How many of you, if you did what I just told you, asked the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit said, well, it's this mud down there. If you pick up the mud and you rub it and you rub it nicely on Johnny's eyes, he'll be able to see. How many of you would have courage to do that? And then add in the whole spitting on the mud bit and then we'll see what the health and safety people have to say. Okay, we had people on the street who were slightly suspicious of our beautifully wrapped Mars bars. So I'd love to see what happens if we started spitting on our hands and doing that kind of thing out in the street. But um, Jesus did, and this man was healed. Um, And the fun part I love about this story is that Jesus did have everyone who comes to him healed, but he did pray twice here. Who's encouraged by that? I am, because I see in scripture, I'm like, okay, God, you, you, you put that creative, you know, strategy into place, and then you, you did it again, and the man's eyes were completely restored. But this isn't a formula, and this I find challenging, because I've now, for quite a long time, been taking people out and saying, draw a little stick figure, ask God what he wants to heal, and um, then he'll heal them, or draw a picture, and, and I keep saying to God, okay, I've got to be careful this doesn't become a formula, You know, I've always got to be asking you, how are you going to do this? What do you want me to draw? What does it look like? Because if you look at the next story, this time um, it's very, very similar, but it's slightly different because he spits on the ground, he makes some mud in the same way and he puts it in his eyes, but the man's not healed right in front of him. Jesus says to the man, you have to go to the pool of Siloam and you have to wash your eyes. How did Jesus know that? Anyone know? How Jesus knew to tell him to do that? He yeah, he asked the father, Father, what, what, what are we doing here? How, how's this man going to get healed? Oh, he needs to go to the pool of Siloam. Oh, really? Yeah, really. He needs to do that this time. So we've got to stay in the process with him as we're creating. So I, I know there's sometimes where I've been painting or doing something and I'll be part way through and I will think I know what the end looks like and the Holy Spirit will nudge me and say, no, you've got to do it this way. And it will completely shift what I'm doing. So I've got to stay connected throughout the process. And I've got to keep asking the Father, what are you doing? And the next time someone comes to me, it might not be the same. We've got to remain creative and we've got to remain open to what the Holy Spirit's saying. Okay, Barney, we'll look at the next one. Okay, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father Um, you've probably heard this a number of times. I know I've heard Andy saying it, but what do greater works look like? Read about all the things Jesus did in Scripture. He said, I'm going because you're going to do greater things. Um, And he already raised the dead. So start imagining some of the things that he wants to do. Andy talked about this a bit last week as well, actually. But this is the scripture where Jesus is talking about his heart and his desire for who we're going to be once he's gone to heaven. And he says, Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. 
What are the signs? In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on the sick people and they will get well. Anyone been trying to play with snakes recently? <laughs> Drinking deadly poison? Okay, I'm not suggesting you go out and you, you start doing these things unless God leads you to. But there's a pretty high bar there for us to aim for. And that's the fun part. We're on a journey. So that's the goal. And we just get to take little steps towards it, like taking Mars bars out to people and saying thank you. Can you do that? I think you can do that. Okay. I'm running through this. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. It's amazing to me that there's been a shift in culture, that it's now normal for people to expect that when Jesus followers pass by, that they're going to get healed just by having a shadow fall on them. And this, this, this is, I've not done a great job at building this up, but for me, I was living in a group of people at Bethel Church who thought it was normal for somebody to be sick and to be handed a piece of art. So put that in your head and you'll be well. But it had become so normal in that culture because it happens so much. And when I look through scripture, something happened in Jerusalem. There was a shift. They didn't just have to bring people to Jesus to be healed, or they didn't have to have Peter lay a hand on someone, but they just had to catch the shadow. And so there's something going on, and I I can't go into full detail about it today, but there is a shift in culture where there's an understanding that God moves in this way. And so my heart particularly for this church, is that we would think it's normal for us to worship wherever we are and to hear the sound of music and for healing to happen. And, you know, my favorite ever story about this, I have to squeeze this one in, I have a friend, Christina, who's completely crazy, and she went to um, get her driving license kind of restored, worked on at the office where they do that, and she's standing at the desk and She's talking to the woman behind, and the woman says, so what do you do for your living? And she says, well, I'm a healer. It's quite bold to begin with. And they start having a conversation. She explains that, you know, she's a pastor, and she's a healer, and she prays for people. And this woman says to her, would you go to the hospital and pray for my nephew? And so, of course, Christina's like, yep, when can I go? (laughs) Um, Anyway, it turns out this nephew is in a really bad way. He has been in some kind of accident. He's been on drugs. All kinds of things have been going on, so much to the extent that he's now in a coma, and his legs and his arms and his limbs are completely swollen. You've heard this story, haven't you? They're completely swollen. And so she walks into the room, and all she can sense is death. I don't know if any of you have experienced that, but there's just an atmosphere in a room. And um, she's like, okay, God, what am I going to do? Like, Holy Spirit, what's your strategy? And the Holy Spirit just says to her to start singing. And I can't remember exactly the song, but it's something like, God is so good. You know, like a song that she knew, there's no way this guy's going to know it. And she's singing this for a while. And all of a sudden she realizes that he's singing it with her. (laughs) This guy's in a coma. He's in a hospital. He can't talk. He can't do anything. But she's just singing a song, and he starts to sing the song with her. And within three days, he's discharged from the hospital. It's incredible. All she did was go, well, actually, all she did was live her life saying who she is, create the opportunity to go to the hospital. She was invited in. She's in the situation, and she asked the Holy Spirit, what, what do I do? She's obedient to the Holy Spirit and trusts and sings. She's not a singer. And he begins to sing and he gets well. He then does the discipleship course in the church and he's now in the school of ministry. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. But we can do this. You know, each of you has things you do in your normal life that you love to create and you love to do. And the Holy Spirit loves to partner with what you love. So I love that Cassie right now is going after seeing people healed through through what she creates for people to wear. 
Who, who, who's with me? I'm getting excited when Cassie's creating yeah. dresses and gloves and fabric, and every time they wear it, that person's life is completely transformed. Come on, yeah. Come on. So Think about what you do and what you can get out there. I'm amazed that God uses my paintings. You know, I'm amazed every time I put that freedom painting anywhere, someone gets changed, something happens. And so I'm having to ask God, okay, you've given me this gift. What am I meant to do with it? Like, how do I use this? Where is it meant to be? And each of us has that. You are creative because you're made by the creator God and you're made in his image. So you just have to ask him what it looks like. Okay. We're doing okay. Okay, we're doing good. Okay, Paul. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even when handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left. That's normal for us to read because it's in the Bible and we've read it lots of times. But I don't think it was normal for people in Israel to do that. But something happened. I've watched it in big meetings where all of a sudden the speaker's feet are covered in jumpers and clothing and bits and pieces because people have caught this idea god god does something what does god do well he releases his presence into that through that person and he can do it through all of us but people in israel had worked out that this worked and it was normal is it such a big jump to think that god would do that through a little pencil drawing so i have my friend sarah we're in new york and she draws a picture of a flower And she says, I believe that if you smell this, your sinuses are going to clear. And this woman smells this little pencil drawing, and her sinus is clear. But more than that, she smells the flower. (laughs) There's no scent on the paper, but she can smell the scents, and her sinus is clear. It's just like God is just creative. He's fun, and he does things that surprise us. So he'll surprise you. Okay, there's a tipping point. It just takes a few of us to believe and go after something for it to become normal. So in Jesus' time, people expected to touch him and to get healed. In Paul's time, they expected to bring handkerchiefs to him and that he would place them on the sick and they would be healed. In Peter's time, they could lay the bodies out and they would expect a shadow to move along. Is it a big leap for us to believe that God's going to move through our creative expression when we partner with him in obedience to do what the Holy Spirit's showing us? So for me, it began with being willing to be in a big meeting in Ecuador with this little woman standing in front of me with a broken finger and saying, please will you pray for my finger? And instead of doing what I'd done a million times on ministry teams and just laying a hand on her hand and saying, Jesus, I just declare healing, pausing and saying to the Holy Spirit, how do you want to heal her finger? And the Holy Spirit saying to me, I want you to kiss it better. And me saying to her, can I kiss your finger? I'm in Ecuador, they'll do anything. So (laughs) it's true. I tell you, they they challenged my faith. A friend, I'll finish the story in a minute, but a friend drew a picture of an eyeball and said, God wants to heal people with eye problems. Okay, if that happened this morning, how many people would come and look at that picture? Put your hand up. Okay. There's a whole load more of you wearing glasses who didn't put your hand up. Okay, everyone in Ecuador with any problem in their eyes would be lined up. Everything from the blind to the partially sighted to the squint eye to whatever, they would all respond and they'd all come and look. And the amazing thing I've watched is that I've gone from seeing one picture and a prayer line that long to one picture and everyone holding the picture and God healing 20 people in an instant. That's a shift. So we used to do it one by one. And then we're like, the Holy Spirit suddenly says, no, just get them all to hold it at the same time. And we're like, oh, why didn't we think of that? And, you know, we're suddenly standing with people with wrist problems and they're all holding it. And they're suddenly like, oh, my wrist has got warmth in it. And they start to move them. And God's healing all these arms all at the same time. And you're like, oh, that was kind of clever. Thanks, Holy Spirit. That helped me out. So there is a tipping point. I should finish the finger story. Okay, the end of that story was I did kiss that finger and her finger completely reformed. And, you know, I just watched. and I was like, oh, really? (laughs) But I was surprised because I didn't expect it, to be honest. I was just learning and practicing and playing. And um, one of the things that challenged me last week when Andy was speaking was he said, 
You know, it took him a long time to start celebrating the little things. Um, how many of you have ever prayed for healing for yourself? Okay, we need to do that more. And I would come back from Bethel and people would say to me, oh, what miracles have you experienced? You know, have you, what personal miracles? And I don't, can't remember how many times I said, oh, not really anything. And I was being like handy because there were lots of little things that God was doing all the way along. So I forgot about the moment that I jammed my finger in a door and it's absolutely agony and it's black and blue. And I paused, put my hands on it and said, okay, God, I need you to heal this. And it's instantly okay. You know, and I just dismissed that or the time that I had a really painful school in spot. And I'm like, okay, God, please, what do you think? What's this? And the swelling goes down. You know, you, you forget. But these are the things we need to celebrate. And it has to begin with us. Like, you know, if all you do this week is ask the Holy Spirit for a creative strategy to bring healing into your own life in private and secret in your room, well done. Because the breakthroughs that you have in that personal place will form a foundation that will give you courage to do that in here on a Sunday morning, to do that in your workplace, to go out and do it in the street, or to do it in your small group. Does that make sense? Okay, so there is a tipping point coming where this city is going to come to us and say, when you play music, people get healed. We're going to bring our sick in because when they're here, they're going to get well. Or when it's normal to take sick people down Buchanan Street because something weird happens when they pass the buskers, you know? There's a tipping point. It becomes normal. Do you know, not everyone reacts like she did. That is just absolutely incredible. You see it in her expression. You see it in her face. The thing that fascinates me with that clip, I don't know if you heard it, was the little point where he says, the church hadn't worked out what was going on yet. Did you hear that? And... You know, you can be in a room full of so many people and God can be doing the most incredible thing and you can completely miss it. And, you know, part of that is about us positioning our heart to see, but the other side is positioning ourselves to be excited about what we do see God doing when he is doing it and not to be worried that the whole world doesn't necessarily see it. Because actually when Jesus walked around Israel, he often said, go home and don't tell anyone. You know, but he wasn't worried about the whole of Israel being transformed and the world being redeemed. He was confident that it would. And so when we begin day by day in our lives just to trust the Holy Spirit one little bit more and to even just think about it, I will be proud of you next week if you come and tell me I was at work this week and someone was sick and I asked the Holy Spirit what he would like to do. And that's as far as you get because you didn't do that last week. Does that make sense? And we all have to start somewhere. And I promise you, if you just start that tipping point, so we flip back in the slides, the painting of the tipping point. The tipping point comes because you keep pouring water in the bowl and eventually it has to tip. But it's just that one little drip at a time and that one little choice to change the way you think, that one little choice to pray for somebody to be healed and to keep going after it. It was the hardest thing in the world this week for me to make it to small group on Wednesday. It was a crazy busy week and all I wanted to do was go home. But I'd created an opportunity for me to have the opportunity to pray for people on the street because I had not done it for a long time and I didn't want to miss the opportunity, however easy it would have been to rearrange that because I had to put myself in an uncomfortable position to create the opportunity for God to do something. And for some of us, we just have to put it in our diary and choose to let it be a priority that we're going to have a go. Because otherwise, it'll be four weeks' time and we'll still be thinking, oh, I really want to do that. And in our heart, we really do. But if we don't put it in our schedule and if we don't get intentional about it, it won't become normal. You know, that's where we want to get to, but we've got to start going after it, and we need one another. I so loved having Swell Group with me on Wednesday. I wouldn't have done it if it had just been me. But because they were with me, it was fun. And we, you know, we did. We had fun. We enjoyed it because we had one another with us. So you need to partner with someone, and you need to get out and just have a go. So we're, we're, we're going to land. 